Welcome to Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report. I'm your host, Dennis Skupinski. This program is going to examine Rosie the Riveter's mom, the working women of the First World War. But before we get to that, we'd like to introduce new members of the National World War I Centennial Commission. They are Robert D'Alessandro, Edwin L. Fountain, Major General Alfred A. Venezuela, Ike Skelton, and Dr. Libby O'Connell. During the Second World War, Rosie DeRiveter, with her rolled up sleeves, was on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Rosie the Riveter posters, magazines, articles, songs, movies, and stage shows would celebrate the accomplishment and encourage the effort of women ordnance workers. During the Second World War, those images of women working and doing difficult and remarkable things for the war effort remain in our collective memory. But this was not the first time that women were called upon to do difficult and remarkable things. This is the story of Rosie's mom, the forgotten women workers of the First World War. American women entered the workshops of men, trading in their ankle-length skirts for coarse bloomers or overalls. They built fabric-covered biplanes, hauled scrap metal, filled hand grenades with powder, made gas masks, processed meat to send to the troops, and helped keep the freight trains running. By filling men's places, at the less than men's wages, they helped win the war, and then they were forgotten. Most women's trades before the First World War were seasonal. Even when women did have full-time work, the wages often kept them at the edge of starvation. Earning four or five dollars a week, a girl could just afford food, clothing, and car fare. There was nothing left over for medical care, savings, recreation. If she worked in a garment trade, she also had to buy her own needles and pay for the power used by her sewing machine. In some factories, she had to provide her own sewing machine, which could cost up to two months wages. During late 1913 and 1914, the United States was going through an economic slowdown. Suddenly, in the early months of 1915, the Depression lifted. The warring nations of Europe needed arms and ammunition, and the United States, officially neutral, was free to supply both sides. Across the industrial north, factories began to order materials and buy equipment. Plants that stood nearly idle began producing nails, rivets, nuts, bolts to send overseas. Steel mills restoked their fires and built new furnaces. Shipyards began to order lumber again. Ammunition plants needed chemicals. Railroads purchased track supplies. Gun makers ordered lathes and milling machines. All of these industries, of course, needed workers. Since the onset of the war, however, the flood of immigrants from Europe had essentially ceased. Still needing workers, factory owners brought in men from other industries and other towns, but there soon became a shortage of workers. Women would have to fill the men's positions. As women moved into new jobs, researchers and reformers began to point out the dangers of the industries that for the first time had began hiring women. In the eyes of the reformers and union leaders, the European conflict created a chance to transform the lives of American industrial workers. For the working women themselves, in 1915, the opportunities for war work brought extraordinary new opportunities in her continuing struggle to make a living wage. This not only affected northern women, but also southern black women. By 1917, the shortage of labor hit northern wartime industry so hard that they started to recruit southern blacks. In the north, southern blacks were not welcome and there were no jobs for them before the European War. However, once the war started and the European immigration stopped, southern blacks were now needed in the north and they were heavily recruited. The new lure of northern jobs coincided with a catastrophe in the south. The bull weevil arrived in southern states in 1913. Then in the summers of 1915 and 16, great floods across the central southern states washed away whatever cotton the hungry bull weevils had missed. With crops destroyed, the planters lost money, no one had any credit, 
and many sharecroppers were driven off their farms. Finding a job as a domestic or as a laundry worker was easy for black women who moved to the north. Moving into a factory took patience, luck, or willingness to work as a strike breaker. The Urban League tried not to let the workers be used as strike breakers. However, employers found no problem finding black workers to keep the factories open during strikes. One union finally called off the strike, and after that the union learned to start actively recruiting black members so they wouldn't have this problem again. In 1917, women still did not have the right to vote. President Wilson supported the women's suffrage. He said, We have made partners with the women in this war. Shall we admit them only to the partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil, and not to the partnership of privilege and right? With each passing week, women were moving into jobs where they had never been before. With America fully at war, the atmosphere in the factories was intense, and the pressure of the war now included an unaccustomed mingling of men and women on the job. Men disliked having their domain invaded by women. They didn't know how to treat women in the workplace, and they didn't want to learn. More important, they feared for their jobs and their wages. The work of skilled craftsmen was being broken down into simpler tasks that could be repeated over and over by lower-skilled newcomers, and the women were turning out to be speed demons. Skilled craftsmen usually worked in well-organized union shops where the men set a deliberately moderate pace, maintaining a sense of dignity and a measure of resistance to managers' attempts to control it. The conflict between these two work ethics, the belief that men's work might become women's work, created a kind of gender war in some shops. Once the women came into the factories, the men were given usually new locker rooms, better dressing and toilet rooms, and a new lunchroom. Still, the men would not allow the women to join the unions and try to keep women from being trained for skilled machining jobs. Within a union, a member could be fined for teaching any part of a trade to a woman. If white women suffered discrimination, black women suffered twice as much. One problem facing supervisors and company owners was that when women were placed in front of large machine tools, some of them broke down and cried. Faced with this, a lot of supervisors simply fired the women, even though they might turn out to be their best workers. Faced with these nervous women, some companies realized that they needed a training program, a separate space, clean and well lighted, overseen by a man, selected not only for his technical skill, but for his ability to behave as a gentleman. Often these schools were just inside the factory doors, near daylight and the sounds of the world outside the factory. These schools became known as vestibule schools. The working women of the First World War, or as we call them, Rosie's mom, paved the way for Rosie to work in the Second World War. They broke the ground in such industries as the steel industry, shoveling coal, answering telephones in the communications industry, working in the lighting industry, and countless other occupations that previously only men did. But the most important industry that the women broke into was the railroad industry. In the early 20th century, railroads formed a primary transportation network throughout the country. During the war, trains not only moved troops, weapons, and ammunition, they also carried the raw material for foundries, factories, and coal power plants, and food for the army and the nation's hungry allies in Europe. By late 1917, the railroads had been nearly paralyzed by insufficient coordination, corporate short-sightedness, and labor strife. The confusion left cargo stranded at supply points. Freight cars full of supplies bound for Europe stood unloaded on East Coast docks. Then in December 1917, in order to keep war materials moving, the government had taken control under a single administration. The Railroad Administration established wages, employment standards, and a basic eight-hour day. From the beginning of the war, the number of women on the railroads had grown steadily. By November 1918, there were more than 70,000 women were on the railroads. Besides traditional industries, Women broke into new industries, such as the automobile industry. They worked on the assembly line, and they also worked as mechanics repairing vehicles. In 
The aircraft industry was young and new, younger than any of the people who worked in it. When war began, only 11 years after the Wright brothers' first successful flight at Kitty Hawk, the airplane was still an experiment. In 1918, the airplane was still largely made of wood, a spruce frame covered with heavy linen and veneer made of lightweight spruce or cedar. When the United States entered World War II, women were called upon again to keep the country's war machine going. Most Americans thought that Rosie the Riveter and Wendy the Welder were doing something new. Female workers of the First World War gained little that was lasting for themselves. They did smooth the way, however, for the next generation. She's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, the riveter, keeps a sharp lookout for sabotage. Sitting up there on the fuselage. That little friend can do more than a man can do. Rosie, the riveter. Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie. Charlie, he's a Marine. Rosie is protecting Charlie. Working overtime on the riveting machine. When they gave her a production knee, she was as proud as a girl could be. There's something true about red, white, and blue about Rosie. 